Well, today, you know, we, as we travel around, both here and in, in, in our recent trip in Europe, we see churches pretty much empty. We're seeing less and less belief in God. Uh, we just don't have churches at full capacity, not even maybe half capacity anymore, except for you know some, some uh, exceptions. And why? Why is that? And I think it's because we're not sure that God exists, because we, we hear constantly in the media, in our, our classes uh, throughout all areas of school, uh, that the assertions that we have evolved from some simpler life form. And um, that brings us to today's message, to deeper faith. And the desired in, uh, outcome is that we be increased in faith, faith in God. And my purposes are to show solid indications that God is the creator of all that is, to compare the alternatives to creation with creation, and to show that God is the best explanation as creator of matter and life. And the roadmap for our the talk today is we're going to take a look at how we determine what is true. We'll look at a list of known truths. We'll examine competing explanations for matter and for life. We'll ask some questions of evolution. And uh, that we'll consider that the best explanation for what is, is God. And then we'll talk about Jesus as creator. So how do we determine what's true? That's what we'll look at first. So I'm going to throw that out, out for you, to you. How do we know what's true? What, how, how, does, how do you personally know when, that something is true? How do others know that something is true? We see evidence of it. We see evidence of it, yes. Any other thoughts? OK, well, let's, let's go on. Well, first of all, we, we personally need to have a desire to know what is true. It, it needs to be the, the core thing that, that, that uh, uh, moves us to, to understand, to, to know. Uh, we want truth. We don't want to be lied to. We don't want uh, wrong information cluttering our heads. And, but you know, it also means we need to know our subjective nature, and that is the heart is deceitful and wicked above all things. I mean, we can easily deceive ourselves if we're subjectively involved, in, it's so subjectively involved that we can't see the reality of the situation. So we have, to, we have to be aware of that. So that's why the desire to know what's true is so important. And we, we uh, determine what's true by personal experience. You know, I think as a kid, I probably touched uh, something hot. You know, maybe, maybe, it was, maybe it was the stove. Maybe it was the edge of the stove. But you know what? Where, where heat is, I don't want my finger to be. I've learned that hot is not good. <laughs> you know? It's, it's a truth that I've learned by uh, personal experience. You know, growing up in Minnesota, we had tornadoes. If we saw funnel clouds, you know, we saw the damage that funnel clouds uh, wreaked on our neighborhoods uh, when they came down. You know, whole woods would be, and forests would be uh, really harmed uh, severely by the, by the tornadoes. And anybody who was caught in it, you know, they were injured or suffered death. So I know by personal experience that tornadoes are dangerous. They can cause destruction. They do cause destruction, and they do cause death. Another thing, uh, I don't know this by personal experience in one way, but following cars too close can lead to an accident. And I, the closest I can get to that is I've been rear-ended three times. So somebody else, you know, I've experienced it, but, but uh, in, in the other way. And I've also experienced it, it just barely coming to a stop in time. So, so I know that following cars too close is not smart. 
So how do we determine what's true? We know by knowing others' experiences. You know, we can look at our brothers and sisters, our friends, and, and we can see where, where things, you know, in different um, scenarios that they've been involved, you know, what works, what doesn't. Um, we hear drug addicts who are recovering tell the horrors of their addiction. So we recognize the truth, even though we've not personally done it, that drug addiction is not a good thing. It destroys lives. And then there's a historical wisdom that, that comes down through the ages. You know, well, you know the, the hot fire, I think that's been known all through age. <laughs> I imagine the first fire that ever existed. Um, you know, what is this? Oh, <laughs> that's hot, I shouldn't touch. Um, yeah, so there is this historical uh, uh, wisdom. But we also, in the historical wisdom, we have to remember that up until Galileo, everybody thought the Earth was flat. That was the truth, everybody, well, the majority of people thought, was that the Earth was flat. We are blessed these days to have the, the, the space shuttles and, and the various um, um, spacecraft we put in orbit take pictures of our round <coughs> sphere. <laughs> so we know the Earth is round. Um, we determine what's true to, when it's in accordance with reality and it's consistent with the facts. It's measurable. Water is wet. We know that. We've, every time we put part of our being in water, we get wet. But staying underwater without breathing, uh, without any kind of a breathing source, is going to kill you. We know that too. Not from personal experience, but maybe, maybe we had an acquaintance or a relative drunk. Um, so, uh, yes, um, that is the reality of, of water. The letter Z comes at the end of our alphabet, not the beginning. Salt is a compound, uh, well, oh, and then uh, mathematical, four plus five equals nine. These are in, in, accordance, in accordance with the reality of our numbering system. They're consistent with the facts through the ages, they're measurable. And salt is a, is a compound of sodium and chlorine, and that can be uh, verified in, with lab experiences. Experiments, I mean. Um, and then the, the preponderance of evidence, the best explanation for something. And, and we use this kind of, of uh, measure for truth all the time. Given the facts, what does the preponderance of the evidence indicate? This is the court evidence kind of situation. This is the kind of evidence that's used to diagnose sickness. You know, Nancy was, they first thought it was the flu. And then they saw a doctor, and, and he thought it was UTI, based on what he understood. Well, then she went to the ER, and they had many more tests, many more uh, facts to measure it with, and they found out that it was an E. coli infection. So uh, the best explanation for the facts, and the more facts you have, the better, too. Um, another, uh, other examples would be troubleshooting uh, uh, problems with a car, for example. Um, maybe it's running rough. Well, what's causing it? Could, it could be a gas line problem. It could be an electrical problem. You know, well, what are some of the other facts? Well, I just had the gas line cleaned and that whole system cleaned and flushed uh, two weeks ago. It's running fine since. It's probably not that. It's probably, you know, I mean, the preponderance of evidence, what the evidence indicates. That's how we determine what's true. And that's certainly the case in our legal system in the courts. Okay, so number two, a list of known truths. We know that there is a reason or cause for everything. That chair didn't come about by itself. It came about through a manufacturing process. Before that, it came about through uh, the obtainment of the ores for the metal. There are causes for everything that we, everything in, in, our, in our existence. There's a reason or cause for everything. I'm here in Santa Maria today. Uh, I wanted to be here, that's one cause. 
I got in my car and aimed in this direction. I landed here. <laughs> Those are the causes. That's why I'm here. <laughs> there are causes for everything. Um, all life comes from pre-existing life that used to be in our, in our biology textbooks, and it was called the law of biogenesis, meaning uh, uh, um, life comes from, is created by biogenesis. Beginning, the beginning is from previous life, would be one way to say it. Um, you know, we come from our parents, uh, tomatoes come from tomato seeds, chickens come from eggs, Eggs come from chickens. Uh oh, gotten that one. <laughs> the egg chicken, chicken egg thing. Same with uh, with uh, acorns and oaks. A oaks come from acorns. Same for fish. The the uh, well, uh, you know, actually, uh, birds. Uh, ha you know, it's the chicken egg. It's the egg uh, bird thing, and and it's it's the egg fish thing too. For most fish, I think some fish are actually live born. And uh, some single-celled organisms like bacteria, they just divide, they just split. There's one, and then there are two, and they're identical. Um, the question is, where did the first life come from? And the consistency of physical and, and chemical laws, you know, if I picked up my computer, went over here and left go of it, I know it would drop down. There's a lot of experience that says things would drop down. Now, I would be utterly shocked if I left it go and it went out through the window. <laughs> Thank God there's consistency in the physical laws. Um, gravity is consistent. Uh, just, just think about water. It has three states, solid as ice or snow, uh, liquid, stuff we drink, the stuff we swim in, and, and vapor. Now, we count on water for, for our existence, for our life, for the life of all the plants that grow food for us. So water has got to get up there before it can come down as rain and bless the earth with, with green plants. Plants that feed us, plants that feed the animals who then we eat, you know, that whole, that whole cycle. So, Water is unique and it has these three states. It rains upon the earth, it evaporates into the sky, forms clouds, comes back down, this constant cycle. Well, why is water like that? It's consistent. There's this wonderful consistency in water. Um, and there is irreducible complexity in the workings of both matter and all life forms, and that we can especially see that in, in humankind. I don't know, does, do, do you remember the uh, talk that Marie gave about childbirth and all of the intricate, wonderful things that happen in the human body for that whole process to happen? It's it just, it just so complex. There are so many things that must come at the right time and happen in the right order. Um, it's an irreducible complex, complexity. Birth doesn't happen with all that stuff happening, unless all of that stuff happens. Um, the, different, uh, the interrelationships of different elements and um, in the micro world, the complexity of the orbits of electrons around the protons and and uh, neutrons in the nuclei. And then there are some, some other things like quarks, hadrons, leptons, and mesons, or mesons, I don't know how that's pronounced. And just think about our human eyes. They collect light, they, they create a, a electric impulses based on the light that they collect, and then that is, is, goes to our brain, which in turn gives us the vision of what the eyes are seeing. Incredible complexity. Just incredible uh, complexity. And then, and then consider that the eye has its own um, cleaning system. You know, the wipers, up and down wipers instead of side to side, and, uh, and window washers. <laughs> you know, is this not just wonderful? <laughs> all, all, this, all this complexity. Oh, ah, yeah, consider the bloodstream. The bloodstream has a lot of work to do. But first of all, it isn't the bloodstream unless there's a heart pumping it. 
So the heart is there pumping this bloodstream. The bloodstream contains, um, well, let's, let's do it this way. The bloodstream goes to the lungs, and what happens in the lungs? It gets oxygenated. So it can take the oxygen, go through all the veins, the, the capillaries, uh, nourish all of the cells with oxygen, take the CO2 wastes and other wastes from the cells, take those back, they go through the kidneys, the kidneys filter out the wastes, and then the blood goes back through the right uh, auricle and ventricle and is pumped to the lungs where the CO2 is, um, is eliminated. Quite a complex system. And all of that doesn't work unless it's all in place. It's irreducibly complex. Okay, and then uh, a list of known truths. Complex things require intelligent design. Now, uh, you've seen this before. That's complex. But, yeah, and we would not look at that and think that it just happened by itself. We know that uh, someone, some intelligent being, uh, had that, the idea of what this is going to look like in his or her mind, and selected the stones that would work for that, and then constructed it until it did work. And something approximating the design they had in mind happened. Uh, complex things require intelligent design. We, we look at that, that's extremely simple in, in one respect, but you know, it's complex in one respect, but in comparison to the human body, it's extremely simple. Complex things require intelligent design. So my point is that the irreducibly complex interrelatedness of all matter in the universe, and of human life especially, demonstrates the necessity of intelligent design. Since the creation of the world, we'll have read this, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, that divine nature is love and care, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Remember that part of what God has created it nourishes us and sustains us. He's our sustainer as well. So let's examine some competing uh, explanations for matter and for life. There's the atheistic naturalist viewpoint. And that viewpoint uh, is that the world exists on its own. God is not involved, does not influence anything or any event in the world. This is godless creation. And sadly, that's, that's the view that a growing majority, I think, well, I don't know if it's a majority yet, maybe not, hopefully not, but a huge, a growing uh, percentage of people uh, hold. The, whoops. Oh yes, um, and, and uh, this, is, this is from um, a statement that the American National Association of Biology teachers, uh, I think it was 1995 when it was uh, adopted, and their, their um, definition for evolution was an unsupervised, that means no God, impersonal, there's no person involved, unpredictable and natural process of temporal descent through time, that's what that means, with genetic modification that is affected by natural selection, chance, no design, chance, historical contingencies and changing environments. Now, two years later in 1997, that was changed because some creationists said, you can't say that and be be true to science, because that's not science's realm. So they backed off of this somewhat. It's, it's, it's not nearly as obvious anymore as it once was. But that chance is the central point of what is happening in evolution. There is no purpose. There is no plan. It's purely by chance. Okay. Examine competing explanations for a matter in life. The other one is the young earth creationist viewpoint. And the young earth creationist viewpoint uh, is the one that many fundamentalist Christians hold. It's that the earth is 6,000 to 15,000 years old. And Genesis 1 is understood literally as a literal six day, six 24 hour 
days of creation and accomplished by God. The old earth creationist viewpoints, there are two. Uh, the theistic evolution viewpoint. Now the theistic, this is, this is um, an effort on the part of religious people uh, to, who believe in God to amalgamate the two together. Um, and and, uh, and it, the definition is, it's natural processes sustain, sustained by God's ordinary providence and uh, they're God's means of bringing about life. My problem with this term is that it seems to be an oxymoron. It's, it's, if you, especially with that view, that definition of, um, of evolution that we just looked at. Impersonal, uh, what was the other term, word? Uh, chance, all by chance. Uh, they're, they're inconsistent with each other. Evolution, uh, evolution starts with life in process. It doesn't even deal with the Earth's creation itself or the universe's creation. It starts with life in process and all as a result of chance. Chance mutations and national, natural selection of those mutations uh, which survive. I can't... Um, see that coexistence of chance and God's purposeful creation. God's purpose is that we are in his image and grow, grow into that image for an eternity with him. We were created with a purpose. Um, I don't know, I, there's, a, there's a story, I'll, I'll tell it at this point, I, maybe I had it later, but um, there was a, a, an evolutionist who challenged God to a man-making contest. And um, they, God and the evolutionist agreed to meet on a, on a certain day. So they met and God stooped down on the ground and he put mud in, in, into a pile and molded it to look like a man. And the evolutionist started doing the same thing and God said, oh no you don't, go make your own mud. <laughs> you got a point. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, um, and then there is the progressive creationist viewpoint. That would be my personal viewpoint. And that first off, God made all matter, and then however long it took, God is intimately and purposefully, intimately and purposefully involved in the creation process from design to accomplish reality in accordance with Genesis 1 and 2. God made us in his image. Okay, let's, ha let's ask some questions for, of evolution. Since we see a cause for everything, what caused the earth to become? Well, evolutionists are, you know, are, they're mostly in the, in the biology fields. The cosmologists would, would take us back to the, to the Big Bang. And um, I think that you know, the, the creation of, of, of all, all ex uh, matter in that way it may be a possibility. I think that's not a bad explanation, but God was there doing it. <clears throat> um, um, God is the uncaused cause and he's the source of all that exists. That, that is a classic definition for God that goes back probably more than a thousand years. God is an, the uncaused cause. Since all life comes from pre-existing life, how did the first life begin? Hmm. How is it, evolutionists, that you ignore the law of biogenesis that all life comes from pre-existing life? They're jumping something there. And they, they, it's fair to ask them these questions. Very fair. How was the, who was the lawgiver for the physical and chemical laws? We talked about some of those. Who determined that gravity would always fall down? I mean, that things would fall down because of gravity. Uh, that's speaking very simplistic. Um, who determined that the rest of the physical and chemical laws would work as they do and be consistent? And just think again of the properties of, of the water being lifted up into the clouds and that all working and working consistently. Um, 
Who was the intelligent designer of the irreducible complexity that, in matter and life that we've talked about? What have you ever seen blind, purposeless, purposeless chance accomplish? What rock structure, <laughs> like the picture I showed, uh, ever came about by itself, by chance? What chair or table was ever made by chance? What cell phone came together out of green slime? How did the DNA code originate? Now, th uh, th those earlier questions were mine. This, uh, I've got a number of questions here from an organization called creation.com. How did the DNA code originate? The DNA code is, I talked about that uh, about six months ago. Uh, it's a language and it's, it's incredibly complex. How did it originate? Who came up with the code? The code works. Must have known what he was doing. Um, since the most mutations are destructive, and that is the truth in biology, how is it you think humans are a result of mutations growing out of green slime? How did new biochemical pathways, which involve multiple enzymes working together in sequence, originate? You know, things happening in sequence. Sort of reminds, this sort of reminds me of when Marie talked about uh, childbirth, that different enzymes and different chemical events, they just have to happen in sequence in, in certain ways. How did that get determined? How, does it, how did it happen? Living things look like they were designed, so how do evolutionists know that they were not designed? No, it's in quotes. Oh, yes, you can see that, good. Um, living things look like they, oh, how did multicellular life originate? How did multicellular life, you know, everything is going along fine, you know, if, if in fact, if you, if you take the premise that evolutionists say that everything came from, uh, from single cells, why, why did they, and that was working, why all of a sudden are there multiple cells? How did that originate? And how did life move from asexual reproduction to sexual reproduction? Asexual reproduction, that's the cell that divides by itself. That was working fine. That works fine for, asex for, for, single, for asexual cells, for single cells. It works fine. Why, how could it possibly go from that to sexual reproduction? How did complementary sexual organs needed at the same time come about? That would all have to have happened simultaneously. Pretty complex, how did that come about? These are fair questions for evolutionists. Why are they expected countless, why are they expected countless millions of transitional fossils missing? There still is not a, a, a fossil record that that shows these transitional fossils. And how is it that fossils demonstrate species stability rather than the new spe species? There's a case in, in one place where a bird was shown as an intermediate uh, species in, in a museum at some place in Europe, in a science biology museum sort of thing. And uh, the bird was discovered as still alive. It was supposed to be a fossil, uh, you know, long gone, only existing in fossils that were millions of years old. Um, and fossils demonstrate species stability. Uh, you know, rabbits, however long ago they might want to go, look like rabbits. How did blind chemistry create mind, intelligence, meaning, language? Artistic appreciation, altruism, morality. How did blind chemistry do that? One here. Why is evolution a religious faith? Uh, evolution takes on a metaphysical nature that puts it in the realm of faith. It's 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 as as and and they're zealots. The the people who um, support it are just. They're zealots, they're religious zealots for um, evolution. 
How does evolution account for hair and nail growth? This is one of my own questions. You know, they keep growing. And good, because, I, you know, I keep getting them all messed up doing stuff. And I'm glad they, they get refreshed. It'd be nice if this wasn't refreshed quite so much, or, or this wasn't refreshed quite so much. But, <laughs> but that's all right. I'll, I'll go with it. God knew what he was doing. And how does evolution answer things like two sets of teeth? Ooh, wait a minute. You need new teeth. <laughs> how, does it, how does it answer things like that? Or loss of, or hair turning white with age, or the aging process itself. Okay, enough of that. Uh, let's look at five. The explanation for what is, is God. God is the uncaused cause. God is the first life. He's life eternal. He was there as the first life. The uncaused cause life. The, the life that was always there. Uh, John 1 verses 1 to 3. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And God is the creator and giver of all physical and chemical laws. He created every aspect of each of the elements and, and all of the mixtures and the compounds that are made from those elements. Uh, uh, he created how they come together and, and what they can do on this earth and how they can be involved. And God is the intelligent designer and creator from nothing of all that is. He is the intelligent designer, and he is the creator, and that is from nothing, and uh, that's for all, for all that is. My point, God is the mastermind above all minds. We'll, let's go back to what Wilma read in Proverbs 3, verses 19 to 20. By wisdom, the Lord laid the earth's foundations Wisdom is something that happens in mind. By understanding, he set the heavens in place. Wisdom happens, understanding happens in mind. By his knowledge, the watery depths were divided and the clouds let drop the dew. Knowledge takes place in his mind. God is the mastermind above all minds and he is the creator. But he created through Jesus. Oh, wait, this one too. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Creation from nothing. Nihil, oh, what is the Latin for that? Do you remember? Ex nihilo. Hmm? Ex nihilo. Ex nihilo. Ex nihilo. Yes, that sounds familiar. Uh, okay, uh, Jesus as creator. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were all present at creation. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And then in Genesis, oh, that's not Genesis 1-2, that's further down, uh, 26 maybe. Then God said, let us, that's God the Father and Jesus, who, who was the word in those days, make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Let, not, it doesn't, it, he didn't say, let me make mankind in my image, in my likeness. He said, in our. And that's, that, this, this is true if you look into the, the Hebrew uh, scripture uh, in the Tanakh, it's that way there too. So, in the beginning was the word, this is from John 1, Verses one to three. In the beginning was the word, and that's Jesus. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. My points. In the light of demonstrable truths, the preponderance of evidence shows that God is the best explanation for all that is, including human life. God is the great creator God. God created through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Believe in and trust in God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Amen?